Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 61 of the MR Running Pains podcast. I'm Aaron Saft, your host, and today's guest is Jessica Vandenbush. Jessica is all things trail running, um, a woman after my own heart. My goodness, she does everything she can for our sport, uh, from volunteering, running aid stations everywhere she can get to, to trail work, to putting out her own podcast and uh, fronting the bill for her own magazine. That's right. She publishes her own magazine called Eat Clean and Run Dirty. We're going to talk all about Jessica, what she does, how she tries to commu- communi- <laughs> create community, and uh, do everything she can to make our sport just a better, funner place to be. Uh, I really enjoyed my my uh, conversation here with Jessica. Uh, apologies, we did have some technical difficulties, so I had to do um, some splicing, and we even had to do a uh, recording on a separate day. So um, if you uh, if you hear some blips <laughs> or some uh, uh, some uh, some you know difficulties, uh, technical difficulties, audio difficulties, my apologies here. Um, did our best to uh, to get this one in because Jess has a lot to share. Um, she's fantastic. Um, really appreciate her time and all she does. So uh, I present to you uh, Jessica Vandenbush. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Hello, Jessica Vandenbush. How are you today? Oh, I'm fantastic, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's always fun after talking for 10 minutes to uh, to have an introduction and say hello. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> um, Jessica, um, we were just talking about where you are. Um, so um, why don't you talk about a little bit uh, about where you are and what brought you to that point in life? Right. Okay. So, that, yeah, that is a big question. I am in downtown Boise, Idaho at a coffee shop called The Flying M, and I just ate a magnificent raspberry scone. It's quite delicious. And um, basically, uh, about three, four weeks ago, I made the big move out west, Um, you know, kind of found a you know, a, a job out in Idaho. Um, I came in here a couple of years ago to run I Am Tough and fell in love with the mountains here and had, you know, been looking at moving out west since then. And this opportunity came up for a job. And and basically, I took, well, I packed everything up and uh, took, one of the things I did to move out west is I took two weeks off to drive out here. Um And I saw all kinds of really cool stuff on my way. One of my favorite things, Aaron, ever in the world is to take road trips and like sleep in my car and just dirt bag around and eat cool food and go running. (laughs) And so I did that for two weeks to get out here and um, had a lot of moving crises and stuff like that on the way. Uh, I had to fire my movers. And so I was like in Texas and I didn't have any movers and all my stuff was there. And I had just wonderful friends that came and helped. So basically, um, made it through moving out West and now I'm here. Well, so I'm, I'm live. All right, let's back up. I didn't have anywhere to live. And so I actually moved to Idaho without a place to live. And I posted on a trail runners, Facebook group and asked if anybody knew of an apartment or anywhere like that. And the trail running community is absolutely amazing. And I, I made some new friends on the internet and uh, a wonderful woman who is like ski patrol out here and backcountry first aid and stuff like that. Wilderness nurse basically on skis um, took me into her home. She had like an in-law suite in her basement. And luckily for me, actually, uh, it's just right in the middle of these three different beautiful parks with like winding single track trails through the foothills. And so right out the back door, I can go running for basically an unlimited amount of miles on gorgeous single track trails through the mountains. That's fantastic. And I've never had that in my life before, you know? And so Aaron, like one of the things, this is such a big ordeal. Um, In Cleveland, Cleveland is really cool and the community is great, but you know, I'd sign up for these mountain races and, you know, we, I'd have a harness and me and my friends would pull car tires around the block in circles, you know, for miles trying to get ready for races. And 
this is the first time where I'll be able to train for a mountain race in the mountains. It's, it's really yeah. cool. It's like a whole new, whole new thing. So that's great. I'm excited to see, you know, what I can do with it. That's really cool. Uh, and so you grew up in, uh, in Ohio? No, actually I'm from Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, born and raised in green Bay and, you know, grew up, uh, pretty, pretty humbly. My dad was, uh, a diesel mechanic and he owned a concrete construction company and my mom stayed home and our vacations were going camping in Northern Wisconsin and fishing and, and stuff like that. And so I think that's kind of how I got into trail running is just my love of being outside. You know, it's not like if, if running was on a treadmill, I wouldn't do it. It's not so I can like go exercise constantly, but that's a good part of it. I love just being outdoors and being in it and running is a cool way that um, you can go and see really neat things that other people can't, that cars can't go and, you know, trail running uh, is special to me because of that. So, yeah, so I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and of course I'm a Packers fan and a, a cheese head and <laughs> my whole family is still there, but being outside is, you know, like a way of life there. It's more hunting and fishing and stuff like that, uh, than sports, but you know, snowmobiling, stuff like that. That's, that's, uh, how I grew up. I moved to Ohio 15 years ago, um, and met wonderful people. And that's, that's how I got into trail running was from the community in Ohio, but yeah, I'm from Wisconsin. Okay. So about 15 years ago, you got into trail running and then that evolved into uh, some ultra running. Um, and you said you've done, I am tough. Uh, so obviously you've done some <laughs> some really hard hundred milers um, and it just kept evolving for you. What, um, I mean, you know, you could start to talk about like the things that you do outside of, of running as well. Cause you have your own podcast, um, eat clean, run dirty, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. So basically I got in a trail or any kind of running about six years ago. I, uh, never was somebody after high school, like I was in sports and stuff like that in school, but, um, it wasn't until we started running at the dojo. I was doing like mixed martial arts and stuff like that. I was training to fight people and doing karate and jujitsu and stuff like that. And, um, we, instead of jumping a rope, we started running and I really liked it. And on a nice day, I, I would skip class. And instead of going to the dojo and being indoors, I would go running myself. So that was really fantastic. And some friends invited me out to go for a bike ride through our national park in Ohio. And I saw some guys running through the forest. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I guess growing up in Wisconsin, you know, I went hiking and stuff, but I never thought of like running there. I don't, it just never occurred to me. Anyway, my, my life was kind of changed that day. I saw some folks running through the woods and, um, you know, use social media to find different running clubs. And I started signing up for a 5k and a 10k. And, um, thankfully the trail running community in Ohio is quite amazing. And that, you know, I, went in with, they took me in with open arms and, you know, I'd stick around every good trail running clubs, got a beer at the end of it. And I'd hang out at the clubhouse and I'd hear people talk about like these 50 K's and hundred mile races. And they were talking about burning river and it just all sounded pretty wild. And, and then one day, um, I was invited to a film festival and, and now I know it was James Varner's film festival. He came through town and um, I went and I saw a movie about Orcas Island. And at the time I hadn't known, like I just was learning that there's hundred mile races. I didn't even know that was a thing or people could do that. And how many days does that take? <laughs> um, and then, you know, to learn that there's like mountain races and I had never been out West or to the mountains or anything like that. I, you know, um, just been in the Midwest and it, it kind of just blew my mind. And, and the people in that movie, they were going through all this hardship, but they're so happy. And they had like this special sparkle in their eye, you know, and, and the, the country just looks so beautiful with all that thick moss. And, you know, it's like a rainforest out there. And, 
And I knew that minute sitting in that chair in that theater with a bunch of folks I was about to know a whole lot better, but didn't know then, that I wanted to be a mountain runner. And not only did I want to be a mountain runner, but a 100-mile mountain runner, and, and then I wanted to run Workers Island. And I just kind of threw myself out there. And, and at the time, I was new to it, and, and I'm the kind of person here, and I'm not afraid to look like a fool in front of people. And so I started, I started a podcast uh, about kind of... My journey, and I thought, well, it's, it's not, you know, and still today, I, I don't pretend to be an expert. I don't know a whole lot about everything. But um, I wished when I started running, when I very first started running and I didn't know running people, you know, my first 5K, I put my bib on my back and I thought that if you walked, that they would disqualify you and some kind of like race patrol would kick you out or something. And, you know, and so I kind of wish that somebody was like, took me under their wing and told me about this kind of stuff. And I thought, well, I might not know everything, but I know a little bit and I'll be somebody's friend that will go find out and, you know, I'll fail first. So other people don't have to, or whatever, you know, um, kind of let myself be vulnerable and, and show the way in that and make it okay to, you know, for other people to be vulnerable too, I guess. And so I started the podcast having no idea what the heck I was doing. And, um, you know, I, I went from, I did a couple of 50 Ks and signed up for my first hundred miler and, and, uh, pretty short. I went to, from a half marathon to a hundred miles in a year and, and just loved it immediately. And through that, you know, volunteering and doing trail work and everything like that, I just loved it so much. And I just jumped in head first, Aaron. And then it, well, it wasn't soon after that, I found out about the hard rock 100. And of course I knew I wanted to run that one too. And so I kind of made it my mission to do different hard rock qualifiers, which is really different, you know, like I am tough or big horn and, you know, stuff like that, or, or real hard races that like, uh, Orcs Island that they're not a qualifier, but they're pretty rugged and remote and, uh, trying to do that by training in Ohio, pulling a car tire around in circles with my friends is, uh, you know, or, uh, training for the high altitude stuff of, you know what in Ohio, when you're training for a mountain race, you run in the middle of the day when it's like 90 degrees with a sweatshirt and pants on and a hat and gloves. So you get heat stroke, you know, like that's the kind of training I was doing. Um, but I learned that from my friends who had been there before me, you know, um, and mentorship's a big part of our sport. I know, as you know, and you have mentors that you look up to. Um, and so getting to run with Lee Connor or Roy Hager, and stuff like that. And they, you know, tell me about how they got started and how they learned stuff. And, uh, you know, and I got more and more involved with the community for a while there. I, I started my own film festival called the burning river film festival. Cause I was so inspired by those films and, and it led into starting a magazine basically because, you know, looking at magazines that are at the, the store. Now you go to the bookstore and there's like runner's world and, trail running magazine and all this they're all shiny and they're full of ads and they have all these you know great articles about how to be faster from people who do olympic trials or you know and there's stuff like that and and that's fine and and those folks they work real hard but you know you see articles about how to you know pointed towards women on how to lose weight so you can have better economy like to me, that's so sad. <laughs> and so I thought instead of like, right, I caught myself writing, you know, I'm one of those write a letter to the editor people. And instead of writing a letter or whatever and hoping they do better, I just got fed up and I thought, well, how about I just do something, you know, um, instead of hoping somebody else does, I'll just do it. And I've never taken a publishing class. I've never even taken a computer class or a design class or anything like that. But I knew that I loved the ultra running community and I knew a whole lot of people that did cool stuff and I just wanted to tell their stories. And so, um, without knowing how to do it, I just did it, I guess, and figured it out on the way and came out with the, you know, the magazine eat clean, run dirty. And it's basically just a collection of the culture of trail and ultra running. And it includes everybody. It's for volunteers, you know, it's for folks that are just at the aid stations. It's for your brother who comes to every single race and patches your blisters. And, but he doesn't even run, but he'd never miss it. You know, and Aaron, you think about, I know, you know, folks like this, like 
there's people who are such a part of our culture and our community that makes such a difference and it just wouldn't be the same without them. And they don't necessarily have to be a runner. So this magazine is about them, but it's also about, you know, the folks that, um, like you were just saying, you know, the guy at Umstead who just got his thousand mile buckle. Like, I want to hear about that. Um, I want to know what runners are doing too. Like what kind of art are they making or what inspires them? What, what stuff are they doing? You know, and, and, hopefully by sharing their stories, it inspires other people to do their own cool stuff and, you know, go on adventures and stuff like that. I don't, so we're four issues in and, uh, we have, uh, 511 subscribers as of today, but that's all. I think that's pretty amazing for a print only magazine, um, that we send to people's houses. Yeah. Um, and it's written kind of by us for us. And it's quarterly, right? Is that right? Yep. Yep. It is a uh, quarterly. The spring issue just came out. It was slightly delayed because I was moving cross country <laughs> and having a, all this, you know, and that's the other thing too, is, you know, I am, I'm the one employee of the magazine. And so when you email headquarters or anything like that, it's me and I have a full-time job and I'm, I think I'm about to sign up for Scout Mountain 100 in, in a two months and so it, it's me with a full-time job running trying to train for 100 miles and putting this magazine together in every free second and uh so be patient uh when you reach out about stuff uh, i am the corporate headquarters <laughs> but um and i'll get back to you as soon as i can um but you know i think also in that you know when i send people the magazine it's like I, I put stamps on it and I hand write out their address and, and I write yeah. people thank you notes and um, it's personal and it is super different than the other ones out there and and for a reason. So sometimes I feel kind of bad that it's not fancier, but it, it's not supposed to be. <laughs> so I mean, it's it's wonderful. Uh, I have subscribed. I, I subscribed back to issue one. Um I love, as you said, just the the articles and how it can relate to to everyone. Um, it, it is fantastic that you know you are so inclusive. Um, you can tell you take the time to to pick your your authors of your articles and the uh, the topics which they cover. It you know it's it's not trying to make anything like the magazines you mentioned. You know we're we're not trying to uh, tell you how to. Um, uh, lose weight in two weeks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or uh, here's a a couch to 100 mile <laughs> training plan. It's, you know, authentic articles um, from, you know, sincere authors that you probably wouldn't hear from otherwise, which I think is fantastic that, you know, you, you went after this and, and uh, yeah, I think it's, totally fine. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be the glossy, <laughs> uh, pretty, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's great. This, uh, you know, this, um, it, it feels like a, a, dur uh, a durable cardstock <laughs> with, you know, some, uh, some authentic, uh, artistry, uh, on the cover. So it's, I, I love the, you know, kind of the homegrown feeling to it. Um, but I mean, talk about some of the, the articles, you know, some of your favorites that you've seen thus far and, and what they've covered. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So part of it is the magazine is, I love magazines and I'm the kind of person that I'll look at like a national geographic or something like that. And they'll have these pictures of really beautiful places and I'll tear it out and like, you know, keep it in a, in a, you know, fold it in a book or I'll tape it to the fridge and I'll um, have ideas about that. Um, because of all the work that goes into the magazine and the really special things that people are sharing in it. I wanted it to feel like something that you wouldn't want to recycle, you know, something that, and something that you either want to collect or that you'd want to pass along rather than toss it. Right. Um, it feels special and important somehow in your hands and it's an experience and that's part of why it's print only. And I won't do a digital ever is because it's interactive. I want you to be able to smell it and feel what the paper is like and, you know, flip 
through it again and again and again and, and maybe tear out some pages and hang it on your fridge or um, tear out some pages and use it as gift wrap or something, you know, like, and sometimes some of the pages are interactive, you know, there's been like a dot to dot of Anton in there. And um, <laughs> there's been like tear out your own postcards. And there'll be more like that, like activities um, stuff uh, in the next summer or spring issue. There'll be a really cool article about growing your like having your own garden and there'll be tear out pieces um, for gardening in there. Um, nice. Some of my favorite articles that we've had are uh, Jeff Kelvert out of Pennsylvania wrote this beautiful article and he's he's president of the Eastern States Alliance. Um, he's really involved with the Eastern States 100 and a lot of the races out there in Pennsylvania. And he wrote a story about the beauty of having a long-term relationship with the same trail and running the same route each time over years and um, kind of how you can have an intimate relationship with a place, but then also what it tells you about yourself and what you learn about yourself. And I thought that was really beautiful. Um, this last issue, the newest one that's out spring or <laughs> it's the winter edition, but uh, one of my favorite articles in that one is about the 20% of women that show up to run hundred milers in rugged country. And, you know, rather than challenging race directors to change policies or, you know, make things more accessible or, you know, I'm sure you heard there's some race directors out there that are giving women a head start so they might be able to run with their husbands, <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'm not asking anybody to have a, you know, make a special concession or a shortcut for ladies. No way. That, and we don't want that. But women do have different challenges. We're different. And so, you know, asking women, what are the obstacles they have to overcome to run a rugged hundred mile race and, and how do they do it? And what are they scared of? And how do they get over that? And what are their goals? And so, you know, kind of women recruiting women. And so I kind of, I have fortunately know some pretty amazing ladies and, you know, I'd reached out to them and asked them to, you know, answer those questions. And Ann Lang who is quite an incredible human. She had shared some beautiful things about running and, um, you know, how it makes her relationship with her daughter different and, you know, where, what it means to her and Sonia Steely, you know, talking about a lot of moms talk about, they feel guilty because they spend time away from their family when they should be home, you know, like reading books with them or, you know, doing laundry or any of the piles of stuff any of us have, there's this mom guilt. And so, you know, she talks about how when she takes the time to go run that it's showing her children that mom is setting aside special time for her health and exercise and wellness and, and teaching them to do the same for themselves and like kind of setting an example that way. And so I, I thought it was just really special it's it's not easy for anybody, but when you read in Runner's World and all this and, you know, it, it, they're just trying to sell the clothes and the pretty pictures and talking about how fast everybody is and not talking about the hard parts, um, it does a disservice to everybody. Everybody has a struggle. Everybody has stuff they're overcoming. Everybody has a story. And so, yeah, uh, just kind of making a way to have those ladies share their story of what they overcome. And hopefully somebody reads that that's always kind of wanted to do a longer race, wasn't sure how, or, you know, felt bad about spending the money for races or felt bad about taking time away from their family or, or what, um, or, you know, women who don't want to have a family and that's okay. And they, they just want to do their own thing and run too. And sharing those stories, um, that, that has been something really special that I've been able to share too. And so many, you know, the, and the other stuff that runners are up to Caleb Efta. He's the race director for high lonesome 100. He's really into fly fishing and to share that and, uh, you know, other ways that runners are getting outside. That's really cool. Um, so all different, you know, all different things. What Rob Carroll, he is a race director out of Ohio. He is also a high school art teacher and he does really cool paintings. And so he did some watercolor paintings of runners for an article and, you know, adding that dimension to it. 
Um, it's kind of like a potluck of our community and our culture, I think. That's cool. Um, yeah, you had touched on um, the, the mothers and I saw a post, uh, might have been you, but um, they had posted about how um, a daughter perceived her mom's, you know, running because she didn't understand what mom was doing. Um, you know, she just knew that she was just out in a way and, you know, didn't understand why or what was involved there. Um, and I, I loved how the, you know, the, the person that posted said, you know, we need to give them the perception of what we're doing and let them experience the same thing. If it's not running, but, you know, taking them outside and taking the kids outside and letting them experience the outdoors and what you're experiencing and showing them, you know, this is why I'm out here. This is why I enjoy being on the trails. I mean, and that goes for both sets of parents, the, the father and the mother, you know, it's, it's, I guess what I show my kids, you know, like, and they come to my races and see my races. So they understand what, what's dad doing? Like, why is he spending, you know, four hours in the woods to, to go run this crazy race? Um, but I love the introspect that, you know, we need to make that, you know, that association for them mm -hmm. that they're, you know, there is value in the outdoors. And if we don't show them that they will never understand it. Like if we don't take that time, you know, like we've got that long run, but you know, if, if they come out and hike with us after that and kind of see some of the things that we just saw, like we take them to a waterfall or we take them to a view or we take them through a pine forest and just let them appreciate it for a moment and see nature like that will definitely, you know, make you feel better about what you do because then their understanding, especially like if you take them to a race and let them, you know, make their own interpretations of what's going on and seeing you, you know, struggle, but make it through. I mean, there's so many life lessons that can be learned through the, the experiences. So um, I, I, I just, that one really touched me. I mean, maybe it was just cause I had just finished Umstead, but <laughs> I got really good choked up when I saw that. Yeah, it was, me, it was one of the, that I saw that post. It was one of the subscribers of the magazine was saw Annie Lang's, you know, article and was taken aback by it. And she uh, posted about it and it was beautiful, but I agree. And that's part of why the magazine or why I love trail running movies is because those are ways that you can show your family what it is that you're doing and why you can't really bring them with you unless they're like literally pacing you out there. Um, but other ways you can do it, you know, my daughter, she crewed me for my first hundred mile race. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways that she can be involved with it, whether during training, she can ride her bike next to me and uh, give me water, but um, or help me pack drop bags. But also she volunteers at aid stations and anybody who's ran Burning River, I, I've been a aid station captain for that race for a while or Mohican has had her food. You know, she's the one who makes the mini chocolate chip pancakes in the middle of the night and stuff like that. And sh she loves it. And, and so telling those stories like through the magazine of ways that you can get your whole family involved, I think is really important and inspiring. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it'd be making those connections. And then, you know, there's uh, an article in the newest issue of, you know, that's uh, diversity and being okay with who you are. Um, do you want to touch on that article a little bit? The um, the diversity, art, the being a better ally article? Yes. yes. About Patagonia. Yeah. Um, yep. So Patagonia is uh, an environmentalist drag queen, basically, that has a really cool Instagram account that I've followed for a long time. And Patty posts different guides on, you know, basically, and it's not just diversity that Patty shares on. Patty talks about environmentalism. And, it, you know, I've got a lot of friends that are lesbian, gay, you know, transgender. And it's a, it's a truth right now, unfortunately, that a lot of people don't feel safe being outside in the outdoors. And that's not okay. And thinking about how can we create a safe environment for people, for everybody that feel free to express themselves and who they are, no matter what, without fear that somebody is going to hurt them, like physical violence or ridicule them or treat them in a different way than they deserve to be treated. And so 
I included, I, you know, partner with Patagonia, first of all, uh, which I was so stoked about having this uh, relationship with, but to, to print that as a way of, you know, giving folks an idea around that it's still, you know, trail running brings you all kinds of different places all across the United States with some people are accepting of all kinds of cultures and some places aren't and they're scared and it's different. And, you know, I guess this is, uh, that was an article to kind of realize that there are still places where people are very much afraid to be who they are and you might be in one of them. And these are simple things that you can do or, you know, that you can stand up for to create those environments where people do feel safe. I've gotten actually a lot of feedback from that article with people just saying like, thank you. Um, you know, cause they, a lot of people feel like they're the only ones, you know, and especially if you're in a rural community and, you know, there's not a lot of other people like you and you don't feel comfortable expressing yourself, then it, you know, to see a magazine print a story about something that's so very real to your life and your circumstance, you know, where you can see yourself in the pages, I think is a really powerful thing. And, and above all else, that's the purpose of the magazine, right? To, to see so people can feel seen by reading it. You know, this feel like this magazine is about them or for them or people that they love and care about. Um, and, and that's why I, I say it's inclusive and uh, independent because, you know, it is. It's for everybody, no, no matter who you are, no matter if you're one of the fast, cool kids or you're slow or you don't even run or maybe you wear dresses sometimes, you know, like it doesn't matter. Um, it, you know, it's for everybody. And so, you know, I guess that's the kind of, uh, the kind of articles we will continue to have are, are things like that and more, you know, and, and, you know, we have, uh, articles about drag queens and we have articles about fly fishermen and we have articles about bird dog hunters all in the same swoop. And, and when I mean everybody's welcome, I do mean that, you know, and that's why we've got that, that full spectrum of story. I think, uh, you know, we, as a collective sport, we try to welcome everybody and make them feel welcome. And I, I mean, I didn't see that more than what I did at Umstead. I, I can't tell you how many different body types, uh, color of, of people, you know, um, gender, transgender, um, disabilities. I mean, you know, Kyle Robido is out there, the, you know, the visually impaired runner. We had, um, Jackie Hunt, um, uh, uh how do you pronounce her last name? Uh, Borson? Yes. Yes, they have to see, right. Yes, yeah, absolutely. She was out there. I mean, uh, you know, like, I, I mean, you know, to, to look at this, I mean, you know, the female winner, um, Heather um, Doherty, she was, she was phenomenal all day long. And I mean, just, I think she was fourth overall, um, you know, first female, fourth overall, like, incredible run. Like, but all day long, you know, like, I smiled at every single one of them. I gave them a thumbs up. And at the beginning of the day, a lot of these people like were kind of like, who's this guy, you know? And at the end of the day, they were doing the same thing. They were, you know, <laughs> smiling, thumbs up. And I think that's the coolest thing about our sport. If we portray that consistent, you know, message that, you know, like, hey, I, I'm cool with everything. Like, it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. You know, like if we can do that, not only in the races, but day in and day out in our community, it, I think our sport will continue to grow. And, and that's something that we're trying to touch on on Hellbender is how to make Hellbender that, you know, more diverse group. You know, I mean, it is intimidating, as you were just saying about, you know, these hundred milers and especially the mountainous hundred milers that we don't get a lot of women. And that's like one of the one, you know, main things that we're trying to work on is how do we open it up to more women? Do we open up just X amount of spots, you know, and say, we want to fill these with all women so that that number grows and, you know, just leave that open for them. And if we don't fill on, you know, the capacity, we don't fill or fill, you know, in late, but it's, you know, these are things in the sport that, you know, are, are really important to, you know, not only the runners, but to the RDs as well. I mean, I see so many RDs trying to make, you know, 
equality and, and not only in gender, but in race, you know, like it's, it really, it's, it's a great time right now. And I think a lot of people have been more introspective and, and, and looking into their themselves, their events, just because of COVID we've had this time where we're, we're socially distant and we don't have that contact. And I think it's, you know, really vital right now that we try to start, you know, remending some of the relationships that, you know, maybe we haven't had in, you know, in, in the past year or two years. Um, so you know, it's, I like, I encourage anyone, you know, to reach out to RDs if they have ideas, um, on, on how to do so, you know, like uh, we are receptive and we are open to, to ideas. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to stealing from other RDs when I see stuff. So, you know, it, like, and you know, if somebody's listening to this and, and has seen something, that's awesome. I want to hear about it. Like, you know, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the, the goal is to make our races as, as open to, to all and to a, you know, the best experience to all. So, uh, you know, please, anybody that's, <laughs> that's listening, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. Um, I know Jessica is, is definitely open to, uh, to hearing people's, uh, articles and stuff as well. So, um, the, uh, did you reach out to most of these people or did they reach out to you? Social media is, a lot of different things, but one of it is a good spot for folks to get together around running and trail running and find information. And in the trail and ultra running for women only page, there's a lot of women there being supportive of one another and asking questions. And, and I asked some questions there trying to figure out, you know, we were talking about why more women don't run like rugged, long races in the mountains and stuff like that. And, there's lots of reasons, but one of them is that they're honestly scared of the animals um, and people, but like animals and that if they ran into a mountain lion or bear or coyotes or snakes, they, and they're alone. A lot of these races you're alone for a long time. You know, they're intimidated by that. They don't know how to deal with those animals. And so um, at the same time, you know, I just moved out West and I sign up for a lot of races all over the country in places that I don't live. And there's animals I don't know how to approach or, you know, how to make sure I'm safe and they're safe. So I thought it would be a really cool opportunity to do a story about bears and bear safety with spring coming up. Um, and that seemed to be one of the really big things that women wanted to know. A barrier to entry really is knowledge around animal encounters and there's all sorts of different bears across the united states there's you know like black bears and there's brown bears and grizzly bears and just all sorts in different parts of the world and the only bear encounters i've ever really had were in pennsylvania and when you see a bear in pennsylvania um you make some noise and clap and stuff and you know as long as it's not like a mom and her cubs or something and and they usually are scared and they run off and that's how you deal with bears but um you know i signed up for a race in canada and if i see bears in british columbia they're probably grizzle bears <laughs> and i i should not like start yelling and clapping at them cuz they'll react in a completely different way and so I took the opportunity of my own ignorance to kind of um, come together around an article around bear safety that I think is cool. It's not just normal um, bear stuff. There's a bear expert out of Alberta. Her name's Kim, and she teaches bear safety school. This really cool woman um, for outdoor folks. And she does online classes and in-person classes and um really strives to keep the animals safe and the humans safe and how to recreate responsibly, but also um, what signs to look for that you're in bear territory, stuff like that. There's been some animal encounters. There was a trail runner in New Mexico that came across some bears and she had a, a bad experience. You know, somebody got hurt. It was her, but not horrible bad. But, um, you know, with that, one of the things that ended up happening was it's the law in New Mexico that if there is an encounter with a bear that they, they kill the animals. And um, she was really upset about that because she didn't know and she might not have reported it otherwise. And so there's different things like that to know too. And um, I think, you know, with trail running and, 
you know, with really encouraging people to get out there beyond their comfort zone and explore new parts of the country. And, you know, with that comes a responsibility to educate yourself about the new environment that you might find yourself in. And so I thought this was a really cool opportunity to share what Kim is doing with moving the community forward through her bear safety classes and the conservation aspect to it with protecting bears and then tied that into a runner out of Pennsylvania. I don't want to give it away yet because the article hasn't come out yet, but there's a pretty cool guy in Pennsylvania that's a wonderful artist and he's hand-drawn these beautiful pictures of bears across North America to go with the articles. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, just another aspect of meeting people where they are and kind of bringing a really interesting responsibility into it. You know, I try to not read any of the other trail running magazines because I don't want to know what they're doing or have it like corrupt my mind or, um, you know, sure. have big, you know, or even um, have, you know, their big fancy glossy pictures and, you know, they're fancy budgets like make me feel bad i want to be like completely uh untainted by what they're doing and i don't know if they do animal articles or not but i don't think that they're incorporating the art that runners make to um you know have educational wildlife stories and that's something that uh, you could definitely expect in Eclair Rendered Magazine, you know, from different bear identification drawings to what their tracks look like. There's some beautiful photos or beautiful drawings of bear poop. And I know that sounds crazy if you could imagine like a beautiful drawing of bear poop, but we have figured it out. And so you can look forward to that in the magazine uh, and then hopefully, you know, they'll be black and white. And then the other side of it is, you know, with that, the pages are not glossy. The kind of paper I get is the kind that you can easily write on or draw on. And so all the drawings are going to be black and white and I'm going to encourage people to like, color them in themselves and make their own art on top of it. Kind of like paint by number for a, you know, trail runner folks that read the magazine. Awesome. And where did, um, eat clean, run dirty. Where did that name come from? Oh, uh, so it's the name, it started off being the name of my running club that I started in Cleveland. We would, um, probably five years ago, I started doing a group run on Monday nights and we would run around the neighborhood about four miles and, and mark the course. And then afterwards, we would go and eat food, but it was at this restaurant that was the first 100% non-GMO restaurant in the United States. And we would go there and I negotiated free beer for all the runners and we would hang out there and, and so eat clean and then um, running dirty with like trail running. But then even more so like why I came up with that name is uh, because eating clean uh, obviously it means like healthy food, right? But healthy means lots of things. And I, this isn't like a diet magazine or, and, and we're going to have recipes and there'll never be a calorie count in any of our recipes ever. But, um, it means putting good things in your body, like whole foods, real foods and, um, quality stuff, but not just food, it's books and poetry and art and culture and exposing yourself to those sorts of things. It means meditation and yoga and, you know, getting enough rest, things like that. That's eat clean. And then run dirty, obviously, is trail running because that's, you know, what I'm partial to. And, that, you know, the purpose of the magazine is to move forward the community. But um, eating dirty or running dirty also as, like, don't be afraid to get messy in the pursuit of your dreams, you know, get dirty in it, get dirty in reaching your goals and don't worry about what you look like. Um, you know, at the running club that we'd have, you know, there are some people who would come and they'd be self-conscious about getting all sweaty and have, you know, it's after work. And so some, some ladies would come with makeup on and, um, you know, their makeup would get all melty and their hair all sweaty and, Maybe they're a little stinky and then we're at this fancy restaurant and, and it's, 
you know, don't care. Like, let it all out. Like, get messy. Uh, it's beautiful. Like, sweat and grit and working hard and and stuff like that. So, kind of don't be afraid to get dirty and messy in the pursuit, whether it's literally your legs are full of mud or you just look like crap while you're doing it or you think you do, but actually it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, but, um, it's, it's working hard and like focusing on, on that. So eat clean, run dirty means that. And that's kind of the magazine. Then if you like know that, and then you look at the magazine and, and we do have all this art and photography and paintings and poetry and then, um, stories of overcoming adversity really and overcoming different obstacles and achieving things um the stories are eat clean run dirty perfect um you've done such a wonderful job of of creating community through uh, obviously a number of different avenues um do you have any like advice for those that maybe don't have as much community and maybe they want to start, you know, like just a group run or something to, to begin the simple process of creating such a community. Oh, I'm so glad you asked because uh, something else I'm working on right now is so Eat Clean Run Dirty was a running club in Cleveland and Akron. And I would like to and I've done some runs in Columbus, Ohio. But you know, now that I live somewhere else, I want those runs to keep going in Ohio and then maybe start something out in Idaho and you know, there's a lot of folks, some of the Founders Club members and different subscribers across the country. I want to encourage them to start their own running club. And if they'd like to do so under the Eat Clean Run Dirty name and they'd like support from me or um, the world headquarters of Eat Clean Run Dirty, um, you know, I, I would love that. And so I encourage folks listening who are interested in starting a group run and not sure how to do it or what to do or, you know, need help negotiating or seeing if they can wrangle up some free beer for their runners and stuff like that um, to reach out to me. And I would love to have like different E-Clean Run Dirty runs throughout the country if that's something somebody's into. But um, my advice to people, even, you know, if that's not your jam and you want to do your own, that's cool, is just start. I think that that's, you know, the story of any of it with um, whatever it is that we do. Don't overthink it. Don't think that you have to have everything figured out before you begin. You can figure it out along the way and it'll be just okay. Um, a lot of times you get, I see folks get some anxiety around wanting to make it perfect before they start something, whether it's a group run where they want all those little details figured out and a Facebook group with lots of followings. And, you know, they want to make sure their first run has 50 people at it. And, you know, they have the route all figured out and, you know, where it's like professional, really organized. It can be like that and it will be, you can get there, but don't think you have to start off like that. It could literally be you and one other person and you guys figure out the route along the way. Um, a good group run starts with just letting, you know, calling it, calling your shot, like saying where to meet and what time. And then from there, another thing would be to make sure everybody feels welcome and invited no matter what. And that's something that we do at all, all of our group runs is um, make sure we clearly state in the description once again like facebook is a really good place for group runs at least that's how i find them um it's really easy to search up events and stuff but make sure that you say in your description you know if this is a fast group you know that you're doing speed work or if people who are walking are welcome our dogs welcome our strollers and kids welcome uh, where do people meet after? Because sometimes people like to like come after work, but then their significant other will meet them out at the pub for the group run after for beer or, you know, like put all that information in it and just start. Um, and you can figure it out along the way and it's fine. And, you know, um, Aaron, there's a, you've uh, met my friend, Chris Cargyle. So he started this really cool website called Group Run Finder. And um, he's starting a database of group runs across the United States and you can find them on a map 
and it has that information. It's actually really cool, especially for people who travel for work and things like that. Group Run Finder, and, and it's an app too. Um, I is, inter- it is that already up and running? Yeah, so um, he's basically launching the app in about a month. And I interviewed him on the Eat Clean Run Dirty podcast last week. And his ask is for people to upload their runs if they have a group run of their own or they know about one in their community to add it to the website so that it creates this network of all the different runs across the country. And then, you know, if you happen to be traveling through St. Louis for work, you can look up on group run finder and you see, Oh, you know, there's a, at this trailhead at 6 PM on Thursdays, this group meets up and you know, all paces are welcome and I could bring my dog. And then, you know, it's, I think it's a fantastic idea. So yeah, his website is up and you can go, you know, go there, upload those runs, but then I think the app will follow in a month, but it's a really fantastic idea. That is, that's tremendous. Um, I'll try to put that in the show notes just as a reminder of folks. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to talk about, if you don't mind, um, aside from all of this that you've already mentioned, you're also a tremendous volunteer. Um, I think some people get a little bit overwhelmed or maybe they are a little bit uncomfortable with, with volunteering, you know, and they don't understand to what capacity they can help out or, or even how to, you know, get involved. Do you mind touching on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, thank you, Aaron. So <laughs> you're very involved as a volunteer yourself and a race director in our community. So I don't want to skip by that. Like, thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. Um, I realized right away when I got into running that this wasn't a, uh, an individual sport, you know, even though like the one person goes running, it's definitely, it takes a village to put on these different events. And that's something that I, I cherished quite a bit right away was the sense of community around things, stewardship and mentorship. And so all of those are different. There's so many different ways that you can volunteer around a race And so, yeah, uh, just talking about that for a second. So one of the ways that you can volunteer for a race, and and none of these require you to be a runner. Um, It it does require you to maybe have a a love of the outdoors, but um, you don't have to be a runner. So doing trail work is huge, and I know you do a lot of that, Aaron, um, out where you live. You do a tremendous amount of trail work. So volunteering with uh, different trail groups around your area to clear trails, they don't take care of themselves especially in the springtime when um, they go through, they don't do a lot of trail work in the wintertime most places uh, because it's hard to get to with snow. So, you know, clearing trees and brush and in the spring there's a lot of mud. So, you know, fixing that on the trails. The other things that you can do to get involved is actually volunteering at a race. And don't feel like you have to know what you're doing to be helpful or to volunteer. Like they, they want you there. Uh, They need you. And one of the things, so I'm volunteering the next, I try to volunteer at as many races or more as I participate in as a runner. I try to have like a one to one ratio at least. And I'm a co-captain for an aid station at the Cocodono 250 that is happening in Arizona. And let me say this. Uh, I don't know anything about running a 250 mile race, but I sure did not let that stop me from volunteering at this aid station uh, because I do have good work ethic, positive attitude, and I make good sandwiches. <laughs> and I figured that that's a, <laughs> that's a good start, right? Absolutely. Um, and I know how to build a campfire. So, um, you know, and everything else we'll figure out, you know, um, and, and that's really like, you just need a positive attitude and to bring whatever skills that you're good at to the aid station. Um, I love aid station work, but yeah, you can all kinds of different jobs at the races basically pretty much are available. Um, and you won't be alone in most, sometimes you will be in smaller races where they had trouble getting volunteers sometimes you will be alone but um that's okay too you just do the best you can and think about it if you are a runner think about um the times that you were at races uh, i'm always just so grateful that these people are there helping like i you know like 
anything that they do, or even if they just say good job, like it means everything. It's so wonderful and helpful to see folks out there. Sometimes you're talking about at Umstead, you're basically running solo for 50 miles. So, you know, your experience going through those aid stations, sure, like not only were you, I'm sure you were thankful to get water or food, but it's just nice to see some smiling faces too, you know, and and have words of encouragement. Absolutely. And sometimes that's all you need. Um, And then, you know, there's, uh, you know, even to after the race, a lot of times you need help at the finish line or cleaning up after the race, but. Um, a project, you know, besides volunteering and, and doing aid stations, uh, currently working on a project to make orientation videos for volunteers at races that um, in, in, co- in um, collaboration with race directors across the country. So that if you are kind of nervous about what to expect or, you know, um, if you got yourself into, I know a lot of times that people get into aid station captain jobs and they've never done it before. And they're kind of nervous and anxious because they want to do a good job. And so, you know, like making a kind of information for them to utilize as a resource uh, to help them prepare for that and what to expect and just kind of best practices from like labeling your cooler and, you know, just different stuff like bringing extra chairs different things that you learn over time, but, um, that would have been, you know, nice for, you know, the first time I volunteered, if I would have known some of the things I probably would have had a better start. So, you know, just trying to help out that way. Um, but yeah, really encouraging folks right now to get out there and volunteer for these events. Uh, you know, as we start up with after COVID things and, you know, they are doing different protocol at the races like staggered starts and individually wrapped food and stuff like that and and you know there is social distancing in place but um we do we need volunteers to make sure that we can have these events and that they keep going it's so important and it's so much fun my favorite thing in the whole world is to help out at a race it's not running them it's not any of that other stuff It's being there for other people um i just love it and I think other people would too, if they haven't done it already, I encourage them to, to reach out to their neighborhood race and help out there. That's perfect. Yeah, no. And, and there's so many other things that go on, right. Volunteering wise. I mean, driving vehicles and uh, packing pickup and cleanup and you know, there's so many other things. So if you're not comfortable with an aid station, there's so many other things that have to be done. So, um, but yes, thank you, Jen. Uh, Jess, that was perfect. Um, and so, um, you know, touching, on uh the magazine um again uh you've got a a great flag that you came up with um (laughs) what what was the uh creative uh impulse there right well i took a chance i i put it in the first issue of the magazine um it's right on the cover where i you know the little price tag thing is um where somebody might put a barcode um there's uh yeah it's basically a pride flag with a uh, Jolly Roger on it, and uh, it says underneath it, "Inclusive and Independent." Um, I don't know if they're swearing on your podcast, but it has a little AF next to it too, and folks usually know what that means. And <laughs> the um, so basically, it came from the rainbow is is the pride flag, but um, and that is part of what this is. But also the rainbow represents nature and the full spectrum of nature. Um, If you like Google the description of the pride flag, it talks about that. And it talks about the full spectrum of things that make us whole. And, you know, so the, the pride flag, the rainbow flag means nature, that spectrum of everything within our realm um, is included like the, you know, the yin and the yang. Uh, But also Quite literally, like, you know, our LGBTQ community, um, all different races of people, um, everybody, everybody, everybody has a place at the table here. Um, if in the, in the world of magazines that have something to do with running, this is the Sunday supper of magazines and there's a spot for everybody at our table. Um, well said, well said. Thank you. So that's. That's what the rainbow means. And the Jolly Roger 
Uh, it doesn't mean we're going to go pillaging, but <laughs> um, it means that we're going to fight for it. Um, we might be feisty. We're not only, you know, we'll be stern. If, if, uh, if there's something not right happening, we'll defend that. We'll make sure that, that it does, you know, don't, don't be quiet. Um, stand up for what you believe in, stand up for what you think is right, no matter what that is. And also, um, you know, kind of in the pursuit, right? Be brave in the pursuit of, uh, whatever those goals are, you know, going back to running dirty and not worrying, you know, like getting messy in the pursuit of things. So it's kind of that too. And, um, so yeah, I, uh, in this last, I sent out an email to all subscribers a couple of weeks ago and it had, um, cause folks were asking like, Jess, like we want t-shirts and all this. And, and I know I'm working on it. I've been talking to wild bill. We're going to, we're going to make some shirts up, but until, until then, um, I sent out uh, a PDF basically or images to all the subscribers and they could do what they wanted to with this flag. And I've had subscribers make um, flags to hang up at aid stations, which is really cool. So that when you come into an aid station, you know, like it's the clean run dirty family, which I just, I love that so much. I thought it was brilliant to um, the, some of the rate, um, the race director of cruel jewel, they made trucker hats, um, oh. which I'm really excited. They, they're sending me in the mail. Um, I can't win. I cannot wait. So, um, th this is our flag, but you know, so it represents that and you know, yeah. So if you're a subscriber and, um, you know, you have access to that and, and you can make it into whatever you'd like to, I just ask people to not like charge, charge money for it but they can certainly make whatever they want out of the flag, but that's what it means. That's um, cool. That's cool. And um, where can they find out more about uh, subscribing and, and the magazine? What's a, a good resource for that? Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, so they could go to eatcleanrundirty.com and there's a link there for subscribing along with, you know, link to some of the other stuff uh, like events and the, um, the podcast link is there, but um, that's where you subscribe. And the subscription is four issues a year, and it's $40 if you live in the United States. And that includes shipping. And we also have subscribers in Canada and in the UK and Finland. So we, we'll do international shipping. So if you're listening and you live in Japan, you can still get a subscription too. And um, you know, four issues a year will be sent to your house and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's uncommon. Hopefully it'll be something that you'll want to like keep on your coffee table or, you know, give as a gift to, it makes a wonderful gift. Um, I think it does, it, especially if you have somebody who's you no, know, like getting new into ultra running, I think it's, uh, I think it would be kind of helpful, like as a glimpse into that, um, that world but it's not just ultra i plan on having like 5k stuff in here too it's all kinds of things um That's yeah and but if yeah. they want to uh to editor-in-chief and uh uh, every other person that's involved in the magazine, <laughs> what's, what's the best way to get a hold of, of, of you? <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I officially have with the magazine, I, I do hold all, um, I have all those jobs, but I have a cop, a copy editor, um, his name is Zach and he's out of Indiana. So he makes sure that uh, everything's spelled right and that there's no grammatical errors. So we really appreciate Zach Bat because uh, who's uh, just gotten into ultra running himself, which is really exciting. He's he's new around the community, but um, he's a he was a subscriber that reached out and wanted to lend his talents to the magazine. And so that's the latest issue um, is probably the most polished just, you know, <laughs> because of that. And because as we go along, I'm learning, you know, how to design better and stuff like that which is exciting. But, but yeah, if folks want to get a hold of me because they have ideas or if they want to write an article or contribute their art, maybe they do something cool. I'd love to hear from you. And you can, there's a contact link through eatcleanrundirty.com. But you could also just email me, Jess at eatcleanrundirty.com or um, reach out on the social medias. And um, 
let, yeah, let me know uh, what questions you have or what you're thinking or just uh, what you think of the magazine. Either way, like I'd love everybody's feedback. I want to hear um, w- what it means to them and, and what they'd like to see in it because um, it's not my magazine, it's ours. Right on. And anything else that we'd be remiss not to say or any parting words you'd like to say? Um. <laughs> that's it uh basically i am recruiting volunteers for the coca dono 250 so the first week in may if you want to come hang out in arizona uh, i'd love to have you we're gonna make s- sandwiches for runners <laughs> <laughs> and offer words of encouragement i think we're around mile 170 so i can't imagine being at mile 170 but um I'll definitely be there in service. So if you're in Arizona and you want to come help out, we'd love to have you. Um, so there's that. And, and yeah, basically that's it. I just, I'm really excited for this year ahead. We've got some really special things coming up. Um, this, the spring issue is wrapping up really well. And the summer edition will be something that nobody's ever done. It, it's, it's kind of groundbreaking and I'm really excited about it. So, uh, if you want to be a part of that, um, we'd love to have you. You're invited. Awesome. Jess, I, from from me in the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for, for all that you're doing. You're a tremendous uh, human doing. I'm excited to see what, what you have in store for the rest of us. And uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I really enjoyed my time with you. Oh, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Like I said, an amazing woman. Thank you, Jessica, again for your time, uh, for sharing everything with us, your story. Uh, thank you for putting out your uh, Eat Clean, Run Dirty publication for uh, all the resources that you have out there for runners, the videos you're creating, um, you know, the uh, um, the podcast you do, which is also Eat Clean, Run Dirty. Uh, I'm going to put, obviously, everything in the podcast notes. She's uh, She's just got a wealth of, of information and knowledge um, that she just loves to share with people. And um, so um, you can always reach out to her on social media as well. She's fantastic. So thank you again, ma'am. Um, in, uh, in the world here uh, of MR Running Pains, uh, the newsletter uh, just came out on April 12th, so um, if you have not seen that uh, in the, and you are subscribed, it is somewhere <laughs> in your email. Check your junk. Um, and then um, if you haven't subscribed, uh, it is on my Facebook page, uh, MR Running Pains Coaching. Uh, if you want to take a gander, you can subscribe on my website, mrrunningpains.com, to the uh, newsletter. And all of my old newsletters and podcasts are on archived on the website you can go to the connect page and you'll find links to both all of the newsletters and um, all of the old podcasts so um, i've also added a search feature there is a page where you can search the website so if you're looking for something specific within the website uh, you can use the search feature uh, you know if, if you use it and it's not working please let me know uh, i want to make sure obviously everything works on the website uh, and everything's functional and easy to use for all um, so, uh, but yes, please do check out the April newsletter. Lots of information in there. Uh, my race report for Mumstead is in there. Um, just, uh, YouTube videos, um, articles about training, um, you know, just all sorts of resources, uh, gear review, shoe review, um, you know, some, uh, um, what I think are, uh, are the best, um, um, ideas for, for fueling. I put in there, uh, songs to add to your playlist, all that kind of stuff. It's all in the newsletter. So please check that out. It's free. Uh, and hopefully you, you enjoy it. Um, as always, if there's things you want to hear or learn about, uh, in the newsletter or on the podcast, if you have ideas, don't hesitate to reach out to me through whatever Avenue you so choose. Uh, you can connect with me, uh, via email running pains at gmail.com, uh, through my website, there's a connect, uh, obviously through Facebook. Um, a number of people have contacted me through Strava, which is really cool. Um, and, uh, I'm getting back to training. So if you want to follow along, uh, my, uh, path is not solidified as of yet. Um, 
the uh, wait list for Hard Rock has not been updated since December, since uh, they're not sure you know whether the race will take place or not. So um, I am going to train uh, just like Hard Rock is going to occur. Um, and if it doesn't, or if I do not get in, I will be racing grindstone this fall as I need a qualifier to get back into hard rock, um, the lottery. So anyway, um, you can follow along there on Strava. Um, I am finally getting freed up, uh, here on my end, uh, after spring break and, um, and getting through some of the, uh, the birthdays and Easter and holidays and such. So, uh, I am going to start creating some more, um, YouTube videos. So please, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel. I try to make some, some useful, helpful videos. I have a number of suggestions there of things people want to see and learn about. So I'm going to be working on those and getting those up within the next month. So subscribe there so you can see when new videos pop up. Uh, or take a pop on over there and see if you see anything that's helpful. Um, the podcast also uh, is uh, is on YouTube, so you can go back to old episodes on YouTube as well. Um, other than that, let's see. Um, track is starting up for uh, for the middle school kids. Um, my son hopefully will be running this season. Uh, he's healthy right now. We've been running a little bit, if you've uh, seen that on Strava. So um, we hope that uh, we'll have a, you know, um, semi-normal season. Um, and uh, it looks like they're going to have a ton of races, but in a very short time period. So uh, not an ideal season in that regard, but, um, uh, you know, he's just excited that he gets to run with his friends and, and compete again. So um, we went to uh, Chattanooga for spring break and went to um, the, the uh, fast break athletics. And those guys took great care of us. Uh, we actually bought a pair of the uh, Dragonfly, the Nike Dragonfly Super Spikes for Keegan uh, to uh, to try out. Actually, they're probably going to be better for um, for his the heel problem that he's been having since they have a little bit more cushion, a little bit more support than uh, than the normal spike. So we're hoping that works out. Uh, for him and doesn't bother his uh, um, his Achilles and uh, his severs um, as he's continuing to grow. The boy just turned 14. Happy birthday, Kay. April 10th, he turned 14. So um, really, uh, really proud of that guy. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, you know, things are, uh, things are moving at a good pace. Um, I've got athletes kind of Coming in and out right now, a few athletes are uh, are finishing up goal races and and need a a little reprieve from from training and coaching. Um, so uh, they're going to be stepping away for a little while. Um, so if you are in need of a coach, looking for a coach, um, you know, just uh, let me know. Love to have that conversation, even if I'm not right. Maybe we can figure out something that is right for you. Thad is still coaching with me too, uh, so Thad is is always an option. Uh, so, you know, you can find, uh, his contact on the MR running pains, um, website as well to connect with him. Um, but again, if you're interested in having a conversation with me about training for something, perhaps it's in the fall, um, you know, just, uh, let me know. Uh, happy to have that, that conversation. So, um, as always, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. My goodness. Um, I gave them a, a huge shout out in the, uh, uh, the newsletter. And, uh, I just want to take a moment just to, to thank all those guys again for their continued support. It helps me keep this podcast going, uh, helps me do the newsletter, do the YouTube videos, all of that stuff. It, it really does, uh, make a difference. So if you can help, um, on Patreon, the link, um, is, uh, is in the show notes, uh, you know, for as little as a dollar a month, you can really help me out, uh, continue all this stuff going. I super duper appreciate it. I know you hear that on podcasts all the time, but it really does. It, it means the world to, uh, to creators, uh, you know, helps us do all this stuff and keep it going. Um, so thank you guys for those that are supporting. Um, and if you can't support on Patreon, no worries. Just give me, um, a like, a follow, a share, whatever you can do to help spread the word so that others can uh, find this resource. Uh, I, I know that's greatly appreciated as well. So thank you guys until next time. I hope you guys have a great week run on. Wrote this song while crew and Aaron on a hundred mile foot race through the trails in the rain and mud. How about that? to go 
One hundred miles to go Coming, rain is coming, can't give a fit. 